Yeah, as you talk about some of the kind of tensions that the concept of infinity brings up between different ideas, what are some of the kind of classic uh, tensions or paradoxes maybe that that, that um, infinity gives gives rise to? Um, perhaps one of them being this idea, as you mentioned, of there's the kind of different sizes of infinity. So it's not just kind of one infinity. What, what are some of the kind of these kind of classic paradoxes? Well, there's there's all kinds of paradoxes that arise with infinity. In fact, I'm, I teach a course now uh, here. I designed a course last year. Uh, the title of the course is just infinity, and and we just move from one paradox to the next. Um, and so, of course, Galileo uh, has a show in that uh, course, but uh, there's many others. Um, so, I mean, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that Cantor proved, which is sort of the most, uh, um, it, one of the most important observations to make about infinity and the nature of infinity is Cantor's proof that there are different sizes of infinity. And what, what he proved was that this, the collection of real numbers cannot be placed into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the collection of natural numbers. So if you have the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, there's no way of matching that infinity up with the infinity of the number line, which has all the real numbers, you know, a place for every real number on there. So, so not only the integers and the fractions and so on, but also the irrational numbers like the square root of two and so on, and the transcendental numbers like pi and e and so on. Then the real numbers include all of those ones, and you just can't put them on a list. They cannot be placed on a countable list. So a set that can be put into correspondence with the natural numbers is said to be countable. And what Cantor proved is that the real numbers are uncountable. You cannot count them, even on an infinite counting. Um, and it was just kind of remarkable and, and mind-blowing at the same time, the idea that, uh, uh, that there are different sizes of infinity, different orders of infinity. And Cantor proved not only that the reals are uncountable, but but that for any given infinite collection, there is a larger one. So what he proved is that, for example, if you have any set, even an infinite set or finite set, doesn't matter, then the number of subsets of the set is strictly larger than the set itself. So one can say this in a kind of, uh, oftentimes when I, I have my students prove it, and then I immediately go to the kind of anthropomorphic version of it. If you have a collection of people, you could imagine forming committees from these people. And what's a committee? Well, it's basically a subset of the people. So there's the, the universal committee, everyone's on it, and there's all the one-member committees and all the two-member committees and so on. The empty committee doesn't have any members. That's the best one. <laughs> but the, the, the theorem translates to the statement that for any collection of people, even if it's infinite, there's more committees than people. And uh, and you can run through the proof. Cantor's proof turns into a proof in this committee case. I'm really glad you, you gave that example because it, it's reminding me of something I kind of wanted to ask and something I don't quite understand about infinity. And I've, I've been thinking, what I've been kind of brushing off on this this big topic the last couple of days. So if you, if you had, a, if you had a, a kind of group of people and you said that you're able to create, there's an infinite number of kind of committees that you could, could have divided that up into, um, um, or even let's just say counting. You could, you could just, you could always add one. You could keep counting forever. What I don't quite understand is, um, given that, given that maybe people are going to eventually die, or you will either just have, you know, one, you will either just, you surely need to stop doing the activity at one point. Um, like, is it really true to say that we can keep? You can keep counting. Well, I mean, I think I think that's a profound objection to make, and nobody has a really good answer to that, right? Because I mean, of course, it's about idealization, and to what extent are our mathematical concepts idealizations of more familiar things? I mean, even when you come with a straight line and you're doing some geometric construction, you know, Euclid told us how to construct the midpoint of, of a line segment, right? We have, we make a, an arc this way with a compass and one this way, and we connect the two lines. This is the method of Apollonius. We can, that constructs the perpendicular bisector and we can make the midpoint that way. 
But of course, even a construction like that, which is totally finite, is saturated with idealization, you know, because the line that you draw isn't perfectly straight, the one that you actually drew. And it's not infinitely thin. It doesn't have zero thickness, right? Because, you know, if you drew it with chalk or maybe you made a, a mark in sand on the ground or something in the old Greek way, um, you know, it's not a perfect line. And the circle that you made, the compass isn't perfectly rigid. It maybe wiggled a tiny bit when you were doing it. And so on. So, so, but of course, you, you might say, well, it doesn't really matter that the line wasn't perfectly straight because it's representing the ideal line, which is perfectly straight. It's not the physical thing. When you draw it in the sand or on the slate with chalk, then the line isn't that thing. That's just a kind of, you know, it's a mental image that's helping you to imagine the perfect thing, right? That exists in some realm of abstraction, you know, Plato's realm of ideal forms. In that realm, in the Platonic realm, then we have the perfectly straight line with zero thickness and the perfectly circular circle and so forth, even though we can't, uh, we can't ever produce those in physical reality. And so, so this problem about abstraction and idealization isn't especially about infinity to my way of thinking. And so your objection really can be applied to any kind of mathematical argument, even finite ones, uh, um, if they're not living up to the perfect idealization. And then, and then you realize, well, actually the mathematical arguments that we're producing are just really only about those abstractions and they don't they're not really making claims about what we can actually do in the physical world. They're, they're about logical connections between these abstract forms that live in, a, in, a, in this platonic realm rather than about anything that we're doing. And so they're not really subject to the limitations of time and space and energy and so on that we will find ourselves limited by in the physical world. So this is one way of answering the objection. You have the wrong subject matter if you're asking, well, I, I would die before I finished. That doesn't say really anything about the nature of the natural numbers as an infinite collection. If you think that that, you know, those mathematical objects, those abstract objects sort of exist outside of time, space and so forth. Mm.